Hello everyone and welcome to the Precision Digital Webinar, an introduction to thermocouples, RTDs, and temperature transmitters. This webinar is designed to be a basic educational course for those of you who have to deal with temperature devices but aren't necessarily an expert. Precision Digital has done a series of educational webinars including sessions on loop powered devices, understanding 2, 3, and 4 wire signals, the fundamentals of pulse inputs, Modbus, and many more. Now all these recordings are available on the Precision Digital website, predig.com. Now a couple of things to get out of the way before we start this session. This webinar is available on predig.com in the webinar archive, um, and you will be sent a link on how to view it after the session. Now, also, everyone in attendance today is in listen-only mode. You cannot speak, but you are encouraged to ask questions via our chat box during the webinar. There will also be a couple of question and answer sessions during the session where we will pick some of those questions submitted to be answered. Uh, we're glad that you were able to join us today. My name is Ryan Shea. I am a product specialist at Precision Digital Corporation, and I will be your webinar moderator today. Don Miller is an application specialist with Precision Digital who often deals with temperature devices. He's working behind the scenes answering your questions in the chat window. And our main speaker today is Joe Ryan. He is a product manager with Precision Digital, and he has over 10 years of experience in the field with all kinds of process signals. He works in design, support, and manufacturing, and marketing of process instruments and controllers. He has a lot of knowledge that he's going to share with us today. Don, Joe, and myself are broadcasting live from the, Pre from the Precision Digital Headquarters in Holliston, Massachusetts. Joe, I think we're all ready to get started. All right. Well, thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, before we dive into the content here today, why don't we take a, a high-level view of what we're going to be looking at, what the objectives are of this webinar, and what we hope you take away from it once it's all said and done. The first thing we hope to do is define what thermocouples, RTDs, and temperature transmitters are. Then we want you to understand how those devices work so that you can evaluate the pros and cons of each type of temperature sensor and temperature transmitter. So we're going to take a very basic look at these, discussing the principles behind them and how they operate, so you'll have a much better fundamental base of knowledge about these kinds of products by the time you leave here today. But before we dive into the technical details, uh, Ryan, you had a couple of questions for the audience. I do. So before we get started, uh, we always like to know kind of who's in the audience and uh, who, who's listening in today. Uh, we have about 100 people logged on today, so we always like to kind of get to know you guys a little more. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions that we're going to do in a poll. Uh, so first, uh, where are you guys located? Eastern U.S., Central U.S., Western U.S., Canada, or probably somewhere else international? Uh, so take that poll really quick, and then uh, I will skip to the results, and we'll kind of see where everyone's from. Uh, looks like a lot of people are voting. Looks like a lot from the eastern U.S., but western is catching up. So I'll give you a couple more seconds to, to take that poll. So it looks like mostly the eastern U.S., uh, which is where we are as well, uh, a little bit in Canada, and then a little bit overseas too. So the next question I have is, what is your level of experience uh, with thermocouples, RTDs, and temperature transmitters? Are you of an expert? Are you an electrical engineer? Do you know enough to get the job done? Or maybe you have zero experience. Uh, maybe you're just learning, or you have no idea what we're talking about. So, so take a couple seconds to, to take that poll, and then we'll skip to the results. We'll kind of show you where everyone's at in this process. So it looks like most people know enough to get the job done, which is good, right, Joe? Uh, yes, it is. That's usually where we find people in these webinars is they're not exactly seasoned field experts or maybe even classically trained people, but they find a way to make it work. And that's why a lot of people show up here, just to get a, a more fundamental understanding of what it is that they've been working with. Definitely. And we've only got a few experts in there, so most people will be, might be hearing this stuff for the first time. Uh, so my last question, uh, just for fun, what is your industry? Are you an industrial distributor? Do you work in manufacturing, pharmaceutical, public utility, petrochemical, HVAC, um, consulting, engineering, aerospace, research, or education, or obviously other? 
So take a couple seconds to do that, to do that poll. Then we're going to move on to, uh, to the rest of the presentation here. So I'll give you a couple more seconds. So it looks like most of you are industrial distributors. So that's, that's interesting. And then uh, only the next one would be consulting engineering. So there's definitely kind of a more centralized group of distributors here than, than anything else, but uh, a good group overall. So Joe, I think, we're, uh, I think we're ready to get started with the rest of the presentation. Well, thank you very much. Uh, for those of you who answered other to the industry, feel free to type into your chat box uh, any other suggestions you might like us to add for future webinar questions, or just to let us know what it is you're doing out there that interests you in temperature measurement. So before we get started into what is a thermocouple, it probably would do us good to discuss what is a thermocouple, an RTD, and a temperature transmitter, just at an extremely high level, so that we'll know what those terms mean. So a thermocouple is a temperature sensing device that correlates a voltage with a temperature. It's the junction of two different metal alloys, and that junction generates a millivolt signal that can be related to a temperature, and that's how it's going to measure temperature. An RTD is similar in that it's an actual temperature sensor. However, it uses a resistance to temperature correlation in order to figure out what the temperature is at the specific point that's being measured. Um, now, as opposed to being a junction of just two wires like a thermocouple is, a RTD uses a resistive element, which uh, is usually some kind of fine coiled wire around a core, and that resistance is what gets measured by your temperature sensing display or your device. The temperature transmitter is a little different. The temperature transmitter will generally connect up to a thermocouple or an RTD, though sometimes you'll purchase this as one combined unit. And it is responsible for taking those low-level signals, the millivolts from the thermocouple or the small resistances on the RTD, and converting that over into a more usable process signal. Usually that's going to be 4 to 20 milliamps, 0 to 10 volts, or something like Modbus serial communications. And that's why it's called a temperature transmitter. It's producing a signal that's much easier to retransmit to somewhere else in your plant. Though there's still going to be some temperature measurement element of it, because it has to measure the temperature physically somehow. With those three devices somewhat understood, let's take a couple of minutes here and look at thermocouples in particular and how it is that those function. And again, we'll have uh, several question and answer sessions throughout this, so if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into your chat box. And if Don doesn't answer them, or even if he does in some cases, we'll take them as live questions in a bit. So what is a thermocouple? Well, a thermocouple is the, one of the most popular types of temperature sensors that you're going to find out there. Um, I think it's actually the most popular, certainly is in my experience. Thermocouples are available that can measure a very wide range of temperatures, from something several hundred degrees C below zero to several thousand degrees C above. They're great in that they're very interchangeable. They have standard connectors. Uh, it's very easy to understand if your device is going to be compatible with one because there's standards that govern all of this. And as far as physical makeup, all it is in principle is two thin metal wires that get welded or some other way bonded together to form a junction. Now, almost any kind of metal can be used for this. However, there are standards that call out what type of metal goes into those wires so that when they're joined together, they make a predictable temperature to millivolt curve. So how does all that work? Well, the junction between two different metals generates a voltage, and that voltage is a function of temperature. That physical property is known as the Seebeck effect. And the idea can be somewhat seen on this uh, image on the left here. You've got a nickel chromium wire, you've got a nickel aluminum wire, and you've got them fused together at the point where I'm going to be trying to measure my 300 degrees C. 
the junction of those wires at that temperature is going to generate a voltage of 12.2 millivolts. So if I have a good reference voltage and my device is properly scaled to take a K-type thermocouple input, I know that this 12.2 millivolts is going to correspond to 300 degrees C. That K-type, which we'll talk about in a little bit, lets me know what it is that I'm trying to correlate to, or it gives me the correlation between my voltage and my temperature, and it lets me know what those metals are. So how do I actually read that signal to turn it into something useful? Well, there's a couple of complex things going on here. Um, it's not possible to simply measure the voltage differential directly by using, say, a standard voltage meter. Because of that effect that causes differential voltage whenever you, uh, that causes the voltage to appear whenever you join two dissimilar metals, if I have something like that K-type thermocouple we just talked about, and I connect up copper wire to it, or I connect it up to some zinc-plated leads on a device, or if I try to use the probes from my voltmeter, I'm going to find that that too is going to generate a voltage, and it's going to create inaccuracies for my thermocouple. So in order to measure that, I need to have some specialized equipment, like the connectors that you'd see here, which are specifically designed for thermocouples. They have the, the proper materials that make up the connectors here that let me accurately bring that temperature into my temperature measurement device. I need to have some kind of reference voltage in order for me to compare what the millivolt is that I'm reading at my temperature source to what I would be generating at ambient room temperature, say. And that is traditionally generated by cold junction compensation, or CJC. Uh, that's a term that you're going to see thrown around whenever you're dealing with a temperature sensing device or that thing that I'm bringing my thermocouple into. Now, traditionally, that would be done by uh, an ice water bath. When, when thermocouples were first popular or if you're learning about thermocouples uh, in the classroom, you're going to do experiments with ice water baths in order to generate a base for you to use as your reference. However, today, you don't see any of that. Today, your devices are going to have a cold junction compensation internal to the device, usually very close to the point where you're making your connections, and it's most likely going to be invisible to the user. So there is some cold junction compensation going on that's creating a reference voltage to read. However, you're not going to be privy to any of that as just a device operator or someone wiring up the thermocouple. The other complexity here is that a thermocouple's output is a nonlinear, complex polynomial equation. So it's not something that can be easily scaled to using a device that doesn't specifically accept thermocouple inputs. You might have seen millivolts and thought, okay, well, I can just use a millivolt measuring device and it'll tell me the temperature. Unfortunately, that scaling isn't easy. Most devices will either have that equation built into them or they'll use a very large uh, table to reference with a lot of points in it in order to keep accuracy. And it's all going to be programmed up internal to the device. So when you go and select on the device, say, a K-type thermocouple input, you're really telling it all it needs to know to be able to access these tables or that equation. So you really do need to have some specialized temperature input equipment in order to properly read these thermocouples. So you've heard terms like type K, type J, type S. Why, what does that mean? Well, as we discussed, thermocouples are made from different metal alloy pairs which get fused together in order to generate that voltage at a specific temperature. And the type of metals that are getting fused determines what your voltage to temperature curve looks like. And it also determines, based on the specifications, what type of thermocouple that's going to be, which is why when we saw that example earlier of the type K thermocouple, we knew what metals were going to be joined. So you know the difference between a type K and a type J thermocouple is going to be all the other characteristics we'll talk about. It's going to be temperature range, and it's going to be um, what the accuracy is. But really what's defining it is the metals that are making it up.
All thermocouples are essentially the, the same concept of a bead thermocouple, which is a pair of wires that just get fused on the end, usually just welded together. And then you put that bead where you want to measure the temperature. However, they get built into thermocouple probes in most cases in real-world applications. And you're going to find that there is a whole range of different probes available. There are needle probes, insulated probes, probes that are specialized for being immersed in materials, uh, probes that are designed to be surface mounted onto pipes or walls or other kinds of fixtures. And really all those are for is your mounting and trying to get your probe to exactly where you want to measure the temperature. So if you know that you have a type K thermocouple and you have a choice between a, a probe that specializes in liquid immersion or a probe that specializes in being bolted onto something, now you're just making that choice based on what gets your temperature sensor as close to the thing you want to measure as possible. Why would you want to bolt something onto the outside of a tank when you could insert a probe into the tank to find out the temperature of the, the material inside? So that's where those choices come down to, or what those choices come down to. Now you'll note here that I say right at the top, save this for later. This screen will be useful for those of you who really are interested in this topic and review the webinar later or go back and download the slides. And it gives you an idea of what the different types of thermocouples are all about. The most common thermocouple out there is your type K, and that's a nice general purpose thermocouple. It's low cost because the materials that go into it are not very expensive. And it's available in a wide range of different probe shapes and sizes and types. It can generally go from something like minus 200 to 1200 degrees C, so you've got a good working temperature range. And it's got good sensitivity as well. For other applications where you need something more specialized, you've got a lot of other options available. But you tend to increase the cost as a trade-off for those specialized capabilities. So for example, uh, if I was going to look at a type, uh, let's say, a type B thermocouple, well, that's great for high temperature measurements because I can get over 1,600 degrees C in that. However, a type B thermocouple is going to have platinum as one of the wires, and that's going to be a lot more expensive than the nickel-based wires going into my type K. So before I've even gotten to the fact that it's a more rare, specialized thermocouple and therefore is likely to be more expensive, the materials that make it up drive up that cost. Especially if I'm going to get something with long lead wires, and now I'm running platinum as my leads. And you can just imagine what that's going to do to your costs. You can see on the table on the right, there's a wide range of different thermocouple inputs. So you want to find one that's going to fit whatever your application requires. Again, type K will do most of those. But there are specialty ranges for high or low temperature inputs. And there are types of thermocouples that will give you a better accuracy. So if you decide that a type K thermocouple is good for you, or you go out and find a different one, what are some of the considerations you need to keep in mind when working with them? Well, we have a few of those up here now. The first one's going to be the connection issues, and I alluded to those earlier. Because any time you join those metals, you're going to get, or two different metals, you're going to get a millivolt generated, or millivolt signal generated, you have to be very careful about your junctions. You can't just run the thermocouple lead, realize you're a few feet too short, and decide to splice in whatever wire you have handy. You don't want to just bring your thermocouple into a millivolt device and connect it up to uh, whatever terminal block you happen to have handy or to a terminal block in the back of your panel. Anytime you have those dissimilar metals joined, you're going to create an accuracy because you're generating something in the millivolt, or you're generating millivolts that are not going to be expected to be measured by your measurement device. So you need to make sure that you use things like the proper connector blocks you need to make sure that you have thermocouple extension wire around when needed that's going to be the same type of thermocouple wire as the type of your thermocouple. Lead resistance is something that can be a problem if you're running the thermocouple lines a fair distance. Uh, thermocouple wires themselves tend to be very thin, so they have high resistances 
and can experience all sorts of millivolt offsets, even just due to signal noise, for example. So if you're going to use thermocouple extensions, you want to make sure you get thermocouple extension wire that's a thicker gauge than the actual thermocouple probes themselves, because it's going to reduce that lead resistance. And the biggest issue that I have, or that I've run into with thermocouples, is noise. Um, people want to run their thermocouple wire um, 20 feet through their plant to, to wherever they want to view the data. And unfortunately, all they're doing is that they're creating a big, long antenna to pick up ambient noise. And that noise doesn't have to be large in order to cause an effect on a millivolt measurement. So you need to be very careful in controlling the noise if you're going to have lengthy thermocouple lead wires. Otherwise, you're going to be experiencing all sorts of jumping and inaccurate signals. A few other issues to keep in mind. You've got some decalibration problems that can come up. Over time, at the extremes of their operating temperatures, you can get some alterations of the thermocouple wire makeup uh, that can affect the readings. And you can get some element oxidation and corrosion if you're operating in extreme environments or, or measuring uh, directly products or fluids or gases that react poorly with your thermocouple choice. The last one we've got up here, thermal shunting, is just a fancy name for self-heating and cooling, as well as a reminder that you need to be careful where you place your probes. So you will get uh, some inaccuracy in your thermocouple because it takes time for your thermocouple to reach temperature. And what I mean by that is if you can imagine an example where you're trying to, as I mentioned earlier, trying to measure the temperature of fluid in a tank, but your thermocouples, say, attached to the outside of that tank, it's going to take time for the wall of the tank to transfer that heat into the thermocouple in order for it to reach temperature. So you don't want to do that. It's an extreme example, but it gets the point across that you really want to keep your probe as close to contact with your measurement point as possible. As you drift away from that, as you mount it to the outside of your devices, or you don't have it centered in your flow pipe, you're going to be affecting the heat transfer that your probe needs in order to get a quick, accurate reading of the temperature. So general thermocouple pros and cons. Let's take a look at these and, and wrap up our discussion of thermocouples. So one of the biggest pros for them is they're popular in most temperature measurement applications. And what that means is you're going to be able to find these items. They're going to be readily available to you at a reasonable cost, and you're going to be able to have all sorts of different equipment that is designed to work with them right out of the box. They're generally lower cost temperature sense options. They're robust and resistant to shock and vibration. Those, uh, the way that they fuse them together is generally very rugged especially if you get one designed to meet for your application specifically or you get one that's ruggedized if you need it. There's a wide temperature range that thermocouples can take in, both in terms of an individual thermocouple's range, but also in that if you need a very high temperature or a low temperature thermocouple, those are available to you. They're pretty simple to manufacture. They don't need any excitation power. They don't have to worry about errors from things like self-heating, like we'll talk about when we get to RTDs. And they can be made very small, or I suppose in theory very large, but uh, they can be made very small so that they can fit into a lot of applications. If you need something that's going to have a probe that goes into a pipe or needs to snake into a small mechanical area so they can measure the temperature at a specific critical point, you can get thermocouples that are going to do that. And again, that's all just picking a thermocouple that has the right kind of probe. There are some cons, though. They do produce relatively low nonlinear sig output signals. The nonlinearity can be dealt with by making sure you have a device that's meant to read thermocouples. As for the low level of the signal, that's a problem so that causes issues, like we were saying earlier, with noise that you need to solve with the installation practices you follow or by including a temperature transmitter, which we'll talk about in a bit. They require a sensitive and stable measuring device. 
Generally, these are going to go into a PLC or into a panel meter or into some other similar temperature measurement device. And you want to make sure that you have a pretty good quality sensing device, otherwise you're not going to be able to take advantage of the good quality of thermocouple you're sure to get, because you are measuring very small voltages. And as I've mentioned several times, they are noise susceptible, which essentially comes down to best installation practices to solve. Uh, Ryan, before we move on, you had a few questions. I do. So we still want to kind of get to know who's, uh, who's on the webinar here and kind of uh, see where you're coming from. Uh, so the question I have for you is, what is your primary application? So uh, what kind of monitor monitoring control and or you know, whatever do you do the most with? So pump control, level, level monitoring, flow, temperature, pressure, or other. So take a couple minutes just to answer that if you could uh, so we can kind of get a sense of what we're dealing with here. Uh, and I'll give you a, a couple more seconds to, to vote on that. I see a lot of people are voting. Um, but I think it's going to be no surprise what we end up with here. So I'm going to show the results so you can keep voting. Looks like uh, we're going between temperature and flow, uh, which temperature doesn't really surprise me being a temperature webinar. <laughs> That's true. I, I'm not surprised <laughs> to see temperature so high. But uh, oftentimes what will happen with this sort of uh, temperature equipment is people who aren't used to dealing with temperature run into an application where they need to know something about it. For example, you specialize in flow meters, but you need to hook up a flow computer that needs a temperature input. And it go. helps to know something about the temperature probes you're offering someone for it or deciding to buy yourself. Definitely. Uh, so thanks everyone for voting on that. Just kind of gives us a sense of where everyone's coming from. Um, one person just said in the chat, all of the above. So that's good. Um, so we'll move on to the question and answer session. Uh, so I have uh, three questions, Joe. Now the first one is from Lou, and um, you can let me know if, if, if this would be a good one to, to answer um, uh, live. He wants to know, how do you troubleshoot a type K thermocouple? Sure, I can give a a little bit of information on that. Um, okay. Obviously the first step in troubleshooting anything would be to try to isolate where your problem lies. Um, so for sake of conversation here, let's just assume that you've done that and you've decided it really is your thermocouple. Well, or at least you suspect it's your thermocouple. The most useful tool I've found for troubleshooting thermocouples in general, but type K included, is you want to have a voltmeter that's got a thermocouple input. Uh, you know you have one of those if you've got a little, uh, a couple of slots on the front where you're designed to plug in those strange looking connectors. Uh, if I may go back a few slides, you'll see this connector here. Um, that kind of connector is designed specifically for thermocouples. They're usually color coded and stamped right on them what type of thermocouple they work with. And if you have a, uh, an ohmmeter that can connect up to these, you're going to see that it will have two little slots in it to take these um, thin kind of connectors. So if you get one of those, then you have something that you can connect up your thermocouple wire directly to. You just screw it into these pins. You bring the wire right in through the gap. And when you screw that cover on, you can plug this now right into your multimeter, and it will tell you what the temperature is because it's now got all the proper connecting points, all the proper materials, it's using the right connector, and it can interpret the temperature. And that tool is probably the thing I found people often don't have. And if you don't have that, well, then you really can't test whether or not you're getting the expected temperatures out of your thermocouple because that's going to be your first step. Is, is the, does the thermocouple seem to be working the way I expect it to be working? If it is, well, then you can start looking at the device you're connecting your thermocouple to. If it isn't, you probably have a problem with, thermo with your thermocouple. So if anyone who doesn't have one of those type of multimeters and works with thermocouples a lot, that's your first step. Is, is you want to get one of those and get some of the connectors that are designed to work with thermocouple wire to bring it into your multimeter. There you and go. Next question. So I have one from Rochelle who's asking, do you recommend using TE terminals in junction boxes? Um, that is a 
Good question. Um, let me remind myself what a TE terminal is. Give me one moment. I think that's probably something that most people would want to know anyway what that is. So, <laughs> Well, I may have to get back to you on that one. It's, it's not a type of terminal that jumps out immediately. Uh, if you mean a, like a TC terminal, okay, there we go. Thank you for clarifying that one. Um, actually, she meant a thermocouple terminal, and, and I do uh, recommend using those. Um, I understand that people want to have their wires terminate into the back of some kind of junction box, or even if they're using a larger cabinet or enclosure to hold their equipment. Um, but you don't want to just connect up your thermocouple wire to some standard copper wire you've got in the back of your truck. You really want to try to make sure you use the appropriate materials and the type of connector for the thermocouple you're using. So I would strongly recommend that you get those kinds of connectors or um, uh, junction points and use those in the back of your panels or your junction boxes rather than just twisting wires together with a with a uh, uh, cap screw there, the uh, uh, wire nut, um, or using whatever you happen to have lying around. I, I would try to use the right specialized components for that for sure. And I have two more questions. you think we have time for two more, Joe? Uh, why don't we fit one more in, and then we'll uh, we have a question and answer coming, a question and answer session coming up at the end as well, and we can definitely hit Perfect. some questions then. All right. So the last question is from Russ, and he wants to know how long do thermocouples last in the field, and what are the warning signs to watch for? Well, how long a thermocouple is going to last really depends on what kind of environment you've got it in. So that would be a much tougher question to answer that we'd really need to talk. Uh, in order to find. However, as far as warning signs, you really want to look for those decalibration situations. If your thermocouple tends to cut out, which will often cause an error in your measurement system, that means that your junction might be breaking or getting weak and losing contact. If it's starting to corrode or oxidize and you start uh, finding it's extremely slow to update or your uh, measurement is starting to drift off of what it used to show, and you can show that inaccuracy, um, so it's essentially looking for any kind of odd behavior that would be showing a mechanical failure, because that's what it's going to be. Keep in mind a thermocouple is basically a mechanical device, so it's not like you're going to have something go wrong in the code or something with the complicated electronics like you might in a, in a PLC or some kind of other piece of equipment. It's going to be signs of real mechanical failure that are going to let you know that this thing is, is going wrong. Perfect. Well, thanks, Joe, for answering those. And you guys can keep your questions coming. We, we have one more question and answer session uh, coming up uh, in, towards the end of the webinar. So we'd love to answer a few more questions for you. Uh, but now, Joe, let's, uh, let's head on and learn some more about RTDs. All right. So now that we all understand the basics of thermocouples, let's talk a little bit about RTDs, the resistance-based temperature measurement devices. So what is an RTD? Well, an RTD is a resistance temperature detector, aka RTD, and it measures the temperature as it correlates to the resistance of the RTD. So RTDs will generally have greater stability and accuracy as well as repeatability when compared to thermocouples, although of course there are always issues of quality that come in here. There are high-end thermocouples that will outperform RTDs and there are high-end RTDs that will outperform thermocouples. But generally, you'll get better stability, accuracy, and repeatability with an RTD. Uh, RTDs are slowly becoming preferred as far as how you measure temperature in a lot of industrial applications because of their high accuracy and their and, and generally in industry, there's just a trend towards higher precision devices. Um, it's not as though a lot of industrial applications really need extreme precision, but when you start doing that cost precision analysis, it, it starts looking very good as the prices of RTDs come down, especially the higher end ones. So they are becoming more common to see in the field. How does an RTD basically work? Well, most RTD elements are resistive elements made by a length of fine wire being coiled around some kind of core. So typically you'll get platinum, nickel, or copper wire 
that gets wrapped around a ceramic or glass core. And that's what you're seeing over here on the left of this graphic. This represents the lead wires coming down, and then you've got the RTD that basically is coiled around some kind of central core element. That material that the wire is made out of, the platinum, nickel, or copper, has a predictable change in resistance as the temperature changes. So once you've got this uh, length of wire crafted, you can essentially just make a lookup table that tells you, all right, well, based on what my resistance is, what's my temperature? And that's how they work. You measure that resistance with your RTD reading device, and then it looks up what that temperature is going to be, because the hotter the material becomes, the greater that resistance is going to get. Most RTDs you're going to see are going to be platinum. It's got a nice linear resistance versus temperature curve. It's chemically inert and resists corrosion, and it's stable over temperatures. However, as I was saying earlier about platinum, and as you likely know, it's not the cheapest metal, and it's one of the cost drivers of the RTDs. So how do you read the signal of an RTD? Well, unlike thermocouples, it's not as easy as just taking a millivolt reading. You've got to generate a small amount of current with your RTD reading device that allows you to read what the voltage is, which is how you determine what the resistance is. So because you're running some current through there, there is a possibility of some small self-heating inaccuracies because any time you're just burning off power on that resistance, you're basically generating heat. Then once you've got that resistance measured, that's how you correlate it to temperature. One of the other concerns here is that you've got lead wires leading to the RTD, which are going to have a resistance. And because the resistance of RTDs is pretty low, you're going to run the risk that your lead wires are actually going to be taken into account as the part of the resistance of the RTD, and that's going to cause some inaccuracy. That's especially true if you have long lead wires on your RTD. That's what three and four wire RTDs are all about. Many of you have probably heard how there's two, three, and four wire RTDs, and the idea is that your two wire RTD is guaranteed to have the lead wire resistances as part of your reading, which for a lot of applications is likely fine, where you don't need extreme precision. But then you've got three wire and four wire RTDs they're designed to help eliminate that error. Two wire RTDs are ones like the one on the left. Everything inside this yellow box here would exist inside the RTD measuring device. So if I were bringing my RTD into a panel meter, all of that yellow framed area would represent what's inside the panel meter. That's invisible to the operator. And then I connect up my leads to my two points, because I have two IRTD, generate my current that goes around here, and I measure what my voltage is going to be. And you can see that there's really no way for me to determine if that resistance is due to the wire itself or whether it's actually from my resistive element. That's where three-wire RTDs come in. With a three-wire RTD, again, most of this is actually going to be happening inside of the temperature, temperature measuring device. And then you've got your three points that you'd be connecting to. But now I've got this additional loop happening here that goes through two of the lead wires. I can measure that, and if I assume that that loop resistance is the same as what I'm going to see on the other lead, like basically taking that lead resistance and let's say you divide it by two, well, if that is what I get on my other leads, so my leads are the same length and the same kind of wire, which in most cases they're going to be, now my device can take that out of the equation. I can measure just the resistance of what's in between where those wires join the RTD. So that's going to get me a much more precise measurement off of that RTD signal because the resistance, which is what I'm measuring, of the wires has been taken out. There's also four-wire RTDs. Uh, the advantage of the four-wire RTD is it's, it's a slight improvement over the three-wire RTD for accuracy. But again, it, removes, it measures and removes the lead resistances in both sets of leads. So RTDs, as I mentioned earlier, can be made from different materials. 
they are usually platinum. However, they can be made more uh, cost efficient, let's say, by going with copper or nickel RTDs. The issues with those is that you've got restricted ranges as far as their, what they can measure because there's nonlinearities in there, there's wire oxidation problems that you have to worry about in copper. So in most applications, platinum is going to be what you're going to want to go with. Um, platinum as a very linear temperature coefficient of resistance. So you, you have a very linear curve between your temperature and your resistance, which makes it easy for devices to measure what the temperature is very accurately. And it has all of the benefits of being platinum as a metal, so you don't have to worry so much about corrosion and things like that affecting your lines or your actual resistive elements. So let's talk for a minute about RTD curves. That's probably a phrase that you've heard thrown around out there whenever RTDs get mentioned. So there's, different, there's a standard that defines for you all the, what the different materials and um, RTDs use for a, a temperature coefficient, and that is the RTD curve. Your RTD data sheet that you, buy, that you get when, it come, when you buy it will tell you what curve to use. And usually, for your platinum 100 ohm RTD, that's going to be a 385 temperature coefficient, or 385 curve. And uh, though this table is a little large, hopefully you can make it out, this column here explains to you what that really means. It's a curve based around ohms per degree C, and 385 is the most common, but there are others out there. There is a 392 and a 427 and a 393. So specialized RTDs may require some type of curve that's less common in RTD reading devices. But I have a feeling that most of you are only going to run into your standard 100 ohm platinum RTD that runs off a 385 curve. But be aware of it when you're specking out devices if you start looking at something that's a little more um, specialized. So what are, what are the RTD pros and cons? Well, they have a stable output for long periods of time. Because they are protected, uh, and they're a little bit more ruggedly constructed than just a weld, um, they don't tend to oxidize or cause problems or have issues at their junction. They can be recalibrated pretty easy and measured fairly easily because they do tend to have a much more linear resistance to temperature curve. And you get very accurate readings out of them, though over a more narrow temperature span. There's definitely some cons with RTDs, though. They've got a smaller overall temperature range that they can take. The cost is often higher, both in the fact that the RTD is more expensive and even the equipment that reads them can cost more because now you have to have excitation current being generated, which means you need to have internal power supplies in your electronics, etc. They're less rugged oftentimes in high vibration environments just because of the way they're constructed. They require more complex measurement circuits, which as I mentioned could increase the price of your associated electronics. And if you need extreme precision, you can run into issues like self-heating and lead wire errors, which you need to find ways to eliminate. Now going with something like a three-wire RTD will help with some of that, but if you're in a laboratory environment, you need to look for something that can get you a much higher accuracy, which is going to drive the cost of the RTD up dramatically. And then there are temperature transmitters, which are kind of an element that's related to RTDs and thermocouples, but not really a direct alternative. So let's talk about that for a moment. So what is a temperature transmitter? Well, the, it's a transmitter because it's designed to take your temperature from the point you're measuring it at and transmit it to some other location. That is why you get these, because you don't want to run your thermocouple or your RTD wire some length to get to a piece of equipment that's far away. So the idea here is that you usually have either an attached or an integrated RTD or thermocouple, which is used to actually measure the temperature point and get its voltage or resistance. But then there's electronics in the temperature transmitter that are going to allow it to change that into some other type of signal. So immediately, right at your point of measurement, you're changing it from your millivolts that you're reading or your resistance that you're reading 
into a 4 to 20, a 0 to 10, or Modbus, a heart signal. There's really anything that you may need in your plant that is convenient for you. And that's why you use them, because now you're transmitting it into a more powerful signal that's more noise immune, that has a lot less problems, or that allows it to integrate into more equipment, because there's plenty more equipment that will take in a 4 to 20 input than there is, say, a thermocouple, than had you just gone with your temperature probe itself. So why would you want to use one of these? Well, there's a lot of advantages to using a temperature transmitter as opposed to measuring the temperature directly from the sensor and then trying to bring it somewhere. Um, for example, you can include local indication and control. Um, that's one of the things Precision Digital does that gets them involved in temperature measurement is people use us for local display and indication because they, they can put the, the panel meter or the field mount device right where their probe is and they can see the temperature to show the operators. And then we can either control the process via relays locally or transmit 4 to 20 milliamps to um, temperature uh, control devices like valves or power controllers or back to control rooms just to send information. And you're not stuck running this thermocouple wire, for example, all over your plant and struggling to find equipment that will read it. You get much greater noise resistance, especially over long distances with those alternative signals. You can run a 4 to 20 milliamp wire and not really have to worry about noise in most applications, whereas you can't bring a thermocouple wire anywhere without noise being a concern. And in general, they allow you to isolate, amplify, filter out your noise, convert it into a serial communication signal if that's where your plant is operating on. It just opens up a whole new realm of possibilities for easily getting that data acquired into your system. And lastly here, it does not require expensive extension wire. If you wanted to run the signal back to your control room and you wanted to bring that thermocouple and that you were dead set on that, you'd have to get thermocouple extension wire. And you can imagine if one of those wires happens to be platinum, for example, it's going to be much more expensive to get that specialized thermocouple wire and run it through all your conduits back to your control room than it would be to just use a couple wires on a twisted pair. The cons, of course, for using temperature transmitters are that you're adding a device to your system. It's going to increase the complexity for the person who has to install it and operate it, and it's going to add some cost. But usually it's well worth it when you consider what the cost is going to be of trying to troubleshoot your system or find other alternative equipment that's going to be able to take in those sensors directly. So having looked at uh, temperature transmitters, let's talk about what we've discussed here today. We defined what thermocouples, RTDs, and temperature transmitters are. We talked about how thermocouples and RTDs and temperature transmitters work, including why you would want to use them, what the principles are behind them. And then we looked at the pros and cons of each type of device and talked about why you might be looking at that device to solve your problem, when you might want to use a temperature transmitter, for example. And with that, Ryan, it looks like you have another question. I have my last question. I promise it's my last. So we'd like to know, uh, how often do you guys specify digital displays? Now this isn't in, you know, we're not asking this so we can give you a call. You know, no one will call you. I don't know who answers what. Uh, it's really just for our benefit of knowing, you know, how many people come to these uh, webinars that actually do specify displays, whether they're ours or anyone's. Um, so how often do you do that? One to two times per year, three to ten times per year, at least once a month, or never? Uh, just something good for us to know. So I'll give you a couple more seconds to, uh, to take that poll, and then I will skip to the results. So it looks like a good amount of people do about 3 to 10 times per year, uh, and then 21% is at least once per month. Um, a few of you never, which is fine. Uh, like I said, we just kind of like to know where everyone's coming from. Uh, and then next up, Joe, we have a few questions. Uh, so this is our last question and answer session, um, and thank you to everyone who has submitted questions for us uh, to answer live. So the first one is from Lewis, and he says, can you cut a thermocouple to length to fit the, the thermal well? Well, you can certainly cut thermocouple wires to make them more convenient on the, on the, the termination end of the wire. But you can't cut the thermocouple itself. 
Um, if you have a thermocouple probe that's, say, just a, a solid metal rod and you're inserting that down into a thermal well by way of a, like a spring-loaded temperature transmitter head or something like that, you can't just cut the thermocouple length. Um, doing that is going to expose your element, if not just cut your element off entirely. Um, so you really don't want to do that. You, you want to get a, a thermocouple probe that is sized appropriately for your thermal well, and if you run into a situation where you haven't, I would recommend that you just exchange it for one that does. You really do want to have those match up well. Mm -hmm. All right, the next one is from Ted, and he wants to know if you can address um, extending therm uh, thermocouple wire. Sure, we touched on that briefly earlier. Um, there are certainly applications out there where you may think it's helpful to be able to run your thermocouple leads a greater distance. But everywhere you've got two dissimilar metals that are joined, you're going to get that small millivolt signal that's the, the very Seebeck effect that makes thermocouples happen. So what you do is you need to acquire thermocouple um, barrier strips that are specially typed to each thermocouple so that all of the points that are going to be making contact with your thermocouple wire are the proper materials. And then you would connect the other side up to thermocouple extension wire. And usually you want to use a thermocouple extension wire that's a thicker gauge than your thermocouple leads if possible. Once you've done that, assuming for a moment that you're not worried about noise, you could basically run that to wherever you would need it to go and then terminate the extension wire just like you would have terminated the thermocouple leads themselves because now you've got no accidental differential metal junctions anywhere in your system. Um, now, obviously, the longer you run your thermocouple wire, the more you're going to have to worry about things like signal noise causing you problems, but... Again, if you're talking about small distances or you're not concerned about noise, et cetera, then you could do it like that and just run your thermocouple wherever it needed to go. I do have two more questions for you, Joe. So the next one is from Jose, uh, and he says, could you give me some uh, real-world application examples where we can use two-wire, two three-wire, four-wire RTDs? And before you answer this, Joe, I just want to let people know that usually we do include a real-world application, uh, but since there was a lot of information in this webinar, um, it just kind of didn't make the cut. So if you would like to know more about how this fits into your application and we can't get to you today in the question and answer, you can definitely contact us and I'll give you contact information um, coming up. Uh, but Joe, do you have any um, applications that you can think of for that question? Sure. So your two-wire RTD is very useful where you don't need high precision. If I just really want to know the temperature of water or oil in my tank, say, and I don't really need to know it down to specific multiple decimal point placement, then a two-wire RTD is going to be fine. Sure, I'm going to have some lead resistance errors, but if I just want to know, is it getting too hot inside my tank, or is it, am I running the risk of it freezing? Well, I don't need extreme pre precision for that sort of thing. And that's the sort of just everyday kind of application where knowing the temperature is helpful, but it doesn't need to be precise, and a two-wire RTD is just fine. Now, if I'm doing, relying on chemical reactions or heat treating or temperature baths where precision starts to become a problem, that's when I would look to my 3 oir RTD because I'm going to want to see those decimal place precision uh, readings and know that they're correct. Four-wire, in my experience, in industrial applications, is very often over the top. Sure, it gets you that extra level of precision, but it's, in my experience, been more kind of a laboratory situation than it is a real industrial process situation. So hopefully that gives you some idea of why you might look to the different types of the, uh, RTD leads. And I have one more from Brian, and he says, looking at each device, uh, thermocouple or an RTD, physically looking at it, how can you tell the differences between them? Okay. Well, if you didn't have to worry about it being built into a probe, it'd be pretty easy. The thermocouple, you'd be able to see like a welded junction of two wires, and the RTD would be able to see some kind of coiled up resistive element. But a lot of the time, these are going to be constructed into probes that makes it difficult to tell. So in those cases, you really want to look at the lead wires. So every type of thermocouple is going to have similar characteristics on the lead wires in that it's going to be two wire. One of those wires is likely going to have a red stripe running down them. 
and they're going to be different colors. Be um, although I suppose they don't have to be different colors. I, I, I apologize. The, the two leads aren't different colors, but the thermocouple types tend to be different colors. So if I look at a probe and I see that it's got white wire coming out of it and there's a red stripe running, running down one, then I'm going to likely know I'm looking at a thermocouple. A, um, a thermocouple wire is generally color coded, so you're not going to usually find that like, it just has black leads coming out of it. It might be yellow leads or white leads, and that, that will help you determine the type of thermocouple that it is. An RTD is easy to identify if it's a four-wire or a three-wire device because I'm going to have three or four wires coming out of it. So if I've got a probe with three wires coming out the back, well, I know it's not a thermocouple because that's just the junction of two wires that are of dissimilar metals. So this three-wire device or this four-wire device, it's got to be an RTD probe. And if I've got two wires coming out of the RTD that seem essentially indistinguishable, there's no real markings on them because all I'm doing is just measuring the resistance and so my polarity probably doesn't matter, then I know I'm looking at an RTD because it really doesn't matter which way I hook that up. So I'd say in most applications that I'm guessing you're going to run across, you want to look at the leads coming from the probe to determine what it is rather than the probe itself. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks, Joe. Our next webinar is on July 28th, which is Loop Powered Devices, the Fundamentals. This is like today. It's an introductory class for those of you who have to deal with two-wire loop powered signals uh, but are not electrical engineers. Uh, and this is a new live broadcast of a popular webinar that we've done before. Uh, so this will help you understand the key criteria for using or specifying a loop powered device. Uh, it will help you know if a loop powered device is qualified for your application and decide if a loop powered is your best choice. And this webinar series is brought to you by Precision Digital, who is helping uh, you become more proficient with process signals, connections, and communications. And we hope that, that we are your source for temperature meters and controllers, digital panel meters, loop power meters, explosion proof instruments, large display panel meters, and more. And if you have any other questions, you can feel free uh, to give myself, Joe, or Don a call um, at the number listed there or our sales email address, and we would be happy to help you uh, with any applications that come up. Thank you so much for joining us today. Have a great day.